You know, I've been talking about earned media value for quite some time on this podcast, and my friends at Eisenberg have just raised the bar on earned media benchmarks with their social index. Social Index now gives you global earned media values across a growing list of six geographies for all your KPIs across the seven top social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. You can now visualize these values for deeper analysis, and they have a look back window over 19 months for historical comparisons. Social Index is updated daily. Don't get stuck with old data. Over 1,000 companies have used the social index to understand the ROI of their social campaigns. And if you work with a social agency, you should demand that they incorporate earned media values into your reports. Get your earned media value for social content. Visit earnedmediavalues.com. Again, that's earnedmediavalues.com. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Dina Bari. She is the CMO at StockX. StockX, for those that don't know, is a Detroit-based technology company that is providing a online resale marketplace for sneakers, apparels, accessories, and collectibles. They connect buyers and sellers using the same methods as stock markets in an anonymous, transparent, and authentic bid-ask marketplace. And on the show today, we talk about StockX, her career, lessons learned as a mom, and how she applies those in leadership, as well as the fact that StockX's indexes are outperforming the S&P 500 in terms of their performance. So the question here for Dina is, is this a collectibles business or an investment business? So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dina Bari. Dina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about all things StockX and uh, sneakers, etc. Before we get there, though, I was curious, I hear you're a mom of three and a CMO. How do you juggle that? And, and does motherhood teach you anything about marketing? So these are true stories, what you're hearing about me. And it is a juggle. How do I do it? I, I guess I just do my best to every day. Every time, you know, that's what I tell my kids. I always say to them at night, you know, do your best every time. And I sort of try to practice what I preach. And I I have learned over the years to forgive myself when I don't get it perfectly because it's just impossible. And we, I'm super lucky in that I have a really wonderful supportive partner who shares the workload um, with me. And, And now my kids are getting to the age where they see how rewarding and consuming my career can be and I think they really love it and um, are learning from that. So, so that helps too. It, it helps me um, realize, you know, the higher purpose of, of my work besides just feeling fulfilled and helping to build great companies. And inversely, you know, I think I've learned to be a good leader from being a mom. Um, you know, one of the things I've been really steeped in over the last week is that school started, right? So my kids had been home for 18 months, um, virtually schooling up until last week. And Last week was just a disaster in our house. Yeah, kids come home. My kids are, my oldest is 12, um, my middle son is 10, and my little son is six. And so they each would come home with their own version of melting down. Just, and, and it was so fun to see. I mean, I wouldn't say that's in front of them that it was fun, but to me, it was fun to see the differences, like what is a crisis when you're six versus 10 versus 12. And what I kept reminding myself when they were like waking up in the middle of the night or they were needing extra time, you know, to get settled for bed or texting me frantically from school saying I'm lonely or whatever was going on. I just kept saying that sentence. I think it's sometimes attributed to Plato, but it goes, be kind for everyone is fighting their hard battle. So if you're six, your battle is you're not on the right playground and you feel like a baby because you didn't get to play with the big kids. And when you're 12 and a new school, your battle is I'm really lonely. I need to have friends. And, you know, I kept reminding myself, be empathetic for them. This is a battle. And that's certainly a lesson that I am able to apply again and again at work as I deal with, you know, all kinds of 
people at all levels who are going through their own battles and somehow it comes it comes back to you right and how you deal with them how you empathize with what they're going through can really change the outcome so true and i love i love how you put that like the quote around the battles and and everyone's battles a little different and especially if you're 6 or 12 that, that it's definitely different i've got a 14 year old girl and the like new school friends thing is real yeah and patience is another lesson that we're trying to teach her you know don't rush into friendships and don't jump on the first person who reaches out to you, take your time, you know, because people kind of reveal themselves over time. And and I think that's another truth that you can bring back to work. And, you know, investing the time in those relationships pays dividends. Let's pivot a little bit, talk about career. Like, how did you start your journey to become CMO at StockX? Where'd you start? Oh, gosh. So in many ways, I talk about landing in this job as coming full circle because I started my marketing career marketing sneakers at, at Reebok. So this was, you know, 25 years ago, almost. I had just finished business school. I had actually switched careers, started out my career in investment banking, quickly figured out that was not for me, decided to go into marketing and use business school as that transition. And my first role out of school was at Reebok. Uh, at, at the time, the company had just been acquired by Adidas. You know, now they've just been divested. And the brand was trying to establish its footing, doing some really interesting, innovative things with hip hop and, and entertainment and, and that convergence between sport and, and music and arts and other culture passion points. And that's where I cut my teeth as a marketer. It was a great experience. It was a really rich, busy, educational three years. And then from there, I went on to a whole series of startups. I sort of had identified that I wanted to work at a company that was younger, more nimble, technology-driven. I wanted that sort of adrenaline pace that you get with technology startups. So left the bigger, more established brand world, went to a startup and, and really never looked back. I'm now at my fifth startup, although of course StockX is you know, a very um, mature startup at this point. And through the years during those various startup roles, acquired all the digital skills um, and just built sequentially, you know, first learning what is e-commerce, what is subscription, learning all about acquisition and CRM and analytics, customer journey end to end, connecting the dots through the life cycle. And so all of that, I like to say, really prepared me for this job, which I feel very fortunate to be in. It's really a wonderful, amazing company, amazing role for me, working with the best people in the industry. So I feel very fortunate. And again, feel like I've been training for this job my whole life. How do you describe StockX? Because I think of sneakers, but I know it's much more than that. So how, how should we think about it? So although you think first of sneakers, we are much more than that. We are the trusted global platform for consuming and trading current culture. So again, sneakers come to mind first for you and for many, but current culture can also be defined through other product types like electronics and gaming accessories or trading cards or apparel, handbags and other accessories. And all of those are products that we do sell on our platform. And we stand in the middle between buyers and sellers uh, who are transacting. And we provide um, that stamp of authenticity that de-risks every transaction and helps the buyer know with total confidence that he or she is getting exactly what he or she expects when he or she bids or buys. That's a very important part, the authenticity part. So you're checking, like in essence, you're certifying that this is, yes, in fact, the product that you, that it is when you put it on the platform. Correct. So we literally take possession briefly of every product that is sold and check it. We have um, the whole SOP, uh, you know, highly trained authenticators that are looking for a large range of signals that tell us this is an authentic product and not a fake, that it is in new or dead stock condition, that it has all the elements that were supposed to be included, whether that's laces or tags or other elements that are included by the manufacturer, uh, and that, you know, that this buyer will be delighted with this item. It takes me to, because you, you're almost like an art house in some <laughs> respects, like uh, if you're certifying the, the, the products that you're providing the exchange for, the consumption or the selling aspect for. So do you think about yourself as like supplying people the products or do you think about yourself as like curating investment opportunities? 
I mean, it's a little bit of both. And, and in some sense, it depends on what the customer is looking for from their experience with StockX. But the company was definitely founded on the premise of sneakers being an alternative asset class or an alternative investment class and improving the way in which people were able to trade that specific asset class. And as we expanded, we saw an incredible product market fit around what we offer, the service and the value proposition that we offer. And we saw that extending to other categories because it's really about the mindset of the consumer passion points in the area, this current culture space in which we play, which is not defined by any single product category. It really is defined by the passion points and the trends that are consuming the heart and mind of the customer right now. And obviously one that's come very much into focus over the last year is this idea of alternative investments. For us, it's been always in the picture, but I think it's sort of hit, you know, in the, in the main consciousness, stream of consciousness, and really become on the tip of everyone's tongue, whether it's talking about NFTs or talking about Robin Hood. One of the things that spurred my interest was a, a report, a recent report you guys put out about product prices that are outperforming the S&P 500. And I was like, wow, like, like I wasn't even thinking about that before. I was just thinking sneakers, gaming gear, et cetera. <laughs> but then it, then it like dawned on me and digging into the authenticity aspects of what you do too. You're much more like Christie's in some respects than you might be otherwise. Yeah. I mean, I, what we're seeing, I think this convergence for consumers, right? We like to go to the customer behavior and what's driving them. And what we're seeing here is these consumers and Gen Z in particular is seeking these culturally relevant investments that align with their personal values and passions. So sure, they could invest in stocks, but the fact that what we offer on our platform sort of converges with their other interests and passion points makes it even more attractive to them. And so, you know, for them, a sneaker might be something that they will wear and part is part of their outfit, part of their identity and self-expression. And it may also be the smartest investment they can make, especially to your point about our indices. You know, all of our indices across our major product categories have beat the S&P 500 um, over the last 12 months. So a smart investment indeed. Tell me a little bit more about the consumer behavior and the, the, the type of consumer that you're, you're trying to pull into the StockX ecosystem. What do they look like? How, how, how do you think about them? And like, are there any categories that you've recently moved into because of it? Yeah. So we like to say that this Gen Z customer, although of course they're generational, you know, so they are by definition defined by when they were born and other demographic characteristics. It's also a psychographic characteristic, a mindset around really standing up for and, and defining your life around your passion points, your values, and wanting authorship over the self-expression and the outward expression of those uh, values and priorities. And so it's a really fun generation to watch. They are very vocal. They have very high expectations. They want to sponsor brands or patronize brands that are aligned with the things they care about as well. And they are driving broader influence and broader consumption behaviors in a way that we really have not seen before. Typically, it was the older generations um, that set trends or influence and led youth culture. And here we're seeing the inverse of that, which is really remarkable. And in terms of their passion points and their trends that they really care about, product categories, which leads us directly to product categories. You know, it isn't, again, a, a really strict definition. Obviously, the passion points span sport, technology, music, and other arts and fashion. And so that's where we, where we may have started with a more narrow set of products like sneakers and then apparel. We quickly began to expand as we saw the areas that this Gen Z consumer was expressing interest in. So that's what led us to launching electronics last year around this time as gaming was becoming so prevalent. It also led us to launch trading cards and broaden our collectibles offering, again, driven by what we were seeing the Gen Z consumer show interest and passion for. And we will continue to watch them and peer around the corner to try to anticipate what is the next category that they're going to be passionate about whether it's for consumption or for investment. Culture and a lot of the categories that you just listed off, 
I mean, they're very global in nature. I understand that you guys have employees kind of scattered around the world and, and, and at least the authenticity centers where you're checking the authenticity of the products. What is it like being in that global environment? And do you have a global marketing team as well? Yeah, we do. So our global growth and expansion is a big priority for us. And we're seeing, you know, tremendous expansion and growth outside of the U.S., even more so than inside the U.S. And we've sort of architected our teams to capitalize on that and to really seize the opportunity that we see internationally. So we have this combination um, for the marketing team of global centers of excellence, plus the local sort of on the ground staffing depending on the function. So I'll give you an example. Within acquisition marketing, most of our headcount is centrally based. Well, you know, here in in today's day and age, there's no location defining that. But part of the, quote, global marketing team executing against a strategy set by a global um, head of acquisition and extended and pushed out into the regions. Of course, we tailor our tactics based on what we know about local consumers, But by and large, that specific strategy is coming from the center. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have um, local talent in the areas of marketing where we feel that it's most important to have that finger on the pulse to really understand the community, understand the influencers and what makes people tick. And so content is a great example where we will hire people on the ground in these key markets to develop truly localized content and experiences to connect authentically with those local consumers. When you're doing that, how do you help draw them back or, or maintain consistency, if you will? Like, I'm assuming that you've got a good process for indoctrinating them into StockX and what you guys are trying to do, but just curious how you manage that. A good process, but always improving and trying to improve, you know, given how quickly we've grown and continue to grow. I think we're never just sitting back and saying, oh, we've got this covered. We know exactly how to do that. So even in the last year, we've made multiple improvements to our process. It is a, it's a constant balance because you want to allow the local markets the right amount of flexibility so they can move quickly because they do tend to you know, want to move at a faster pace, try things really quickly. Those new regions want to be their own startups. And yet as a global brand, we want to enforce cohesion, clear brand standards, and also best practices where we feel like we've already learned and can save some of those learnings and drive efficiencies. And so, you know, we do a number of practices or rituals to allow that balance between flexibility and standardization. You know, on the brand side, for example, we have a really clear set. We just went through a brand refresh earlier this year, and we established um, and published a really clear set of guidelines that we shared out and make a part of everyone's onboarding so that they can really see what is a pretty comprehensive document outlining what's okay and what's not okay. And then we have touch points along the way with our chief creative officer and other sort of central central centers of excellence um, to make sure that the local graphic artists or creative directors are not going too far astray. Dina, I want to talk about marketing a minute because like there's this thread in, in our conversation. And I don't know if you see it as a thread, but if you, if you go all the way pre-marketing days, you were in investment banking. Investment banking is a little bit like making a market in many cases. <laughs> You're now, it's flash forward. You switch careers, functions. You had a successful landings at multiple startups. You're at StockX. You're back to making markets. Uh, <laughs> so like, what, do, what does marketing look like? You've got kind of the you know, sellers and buyers, I guess, that you're, you're trying to bring into the fold. We have sellers and buyers, and they're both equally important for our ecosystem to be healthy and thriving, but we don't treat them the same. So from a marketing point of view, most of our what someone from the outside would consider the marketing team, most of our time is spent on buyer marketing. Uh, we've always had this adage that if we focus on the demand side of the equation, the supply side will show up, right? Because if you have a big, robust base of buyers, people are going to want to tap into that. Sellers are going to want to tap into that. So most of our dollars, most of our content, partnerships, all of the activities that you might think of when you think of StockX marketing, those are targeted towards the buy side. And then we partner closely with the seller team that thinks about things like seller policies, which is marketing in its own sense, right? How do we incentivize sellers to um, be sticky and behave 
the way that we want them to behave on the platform. They focus on seller acquisition and seller account management, but it's more of a high touch sort of account management, almost what you would consider like a sales uh, or B2B marketing function and less of a technology data-driven um, scaled marketing function like we deploy on the buy side. So we, we do have two pretty different notions of marketing, one that really addresses the buy side, one that really addresses the sell side. Of course, we're connected. We work together to support one another and make sure there's a strong handshake, um, but we don't just apply one size fits all. Thanks for going down that that rabbit hole with me because it, it just dawned on me as we were talking and your background and it does make it a little bit more complex, but focusing, like you said, a good number of your scale resources on the demand side because the supply follows the demand makes perfect sense. You know, if the buyers are there, the supply will show up. <laughs> so tell me a little bit. I mean, you got complexity of different types of marketing going on. You've got the global footprint. Like, how do you approach leadership? I would say there are a few hallmarks to my style. One is to take a very human centric approach to leadership. You know, I think I believe in, you know, if you think of your team as people, as whole people, and you think about what makes them happy, what makes them inspired, what motivates them, and you give them space to bring their entire selves to work because like you just described in my life, <laughs> there's a lot going on outside of the office. And in every single one of my team members' lives, there's a lot going on. And they can't put up a brick wall between their home life and their work life. Um, or if they can, they're probably suffering. And so I really do try to embody that human-centric approach that contemplates the whole person, gives them space to be themselves, their their true, you know, balanced self, and also to understand what motivates them, what makes them tick, and give them, um, you know, the opportunity to nurture that through their work. I would say the other thing is... I believe in sort of setting a really clear agenda, you know, clear goals, clear sort of strategic vision, but then allowing people to do their jobs. Because if I'm doing my job well, I've brought in people who are better at their jobs than I am. And so I should just stay out of their way as long as I'm providing clear direction as a, you know, clear support, removing obstacles, that type of thing. But otherwise, the best thing I can probably do is just allow them to do their best work. Um, and so I try to not get in their way, not breathe down their necks, and yet stay close enough that I can help when they need help. Well, I, one of the things we like to do is get to know the person behind the microphone. We already know you have three kids, so we've, we're learning a little bit about you already. But I love asking this question, which has there been an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? So I think there are two things I would want to share. One is just you know the influence of my family on me today. And, you know, I, maybe I, I'm thinking about it a lot right now because I'm a parent, you know, and I want to think about how my actions, words are impacting my children. But it's also just, I think, being, um, you know, watching my parents grow older and, and living a little bit farther from home now. Um, we were just reunited for the first time in almost two years. And it just made me appreciate them and the amazing influence they've had on my life. And so, so that's one thing I would share. It's just like my, I am my parents' daughter, a hundred percent. And even my sister, who's my older sister, um, they've just, the three of them have had so much of an impact on my values, my work ethic, my view on the importance of the family unit, the role of, you know, a balanced work life, work and life balancing each other out. Um, and, and maybe that's why I care so much about my own team members' personal lives, um, because I know the impact that my personal life has had on my professional life. So that's just one thing is just, you know, maybe call your parents if you can. <laughs> um, <laughs> think of something they've done to to um, help you be the human that you are. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to share is, you know, more of what someone, someone may consider a negative story, but I think it's important for people to know that this happens, um, which was a, a time I was laid off from my job. You know, this happened to me when I was, I think I was, 30. I was, you know, in my first startup role and had been there for about two and a half years. And the company went through a pretty large downsizing. And I was part of that list. And it was such a blow to my ego. You know, I took it so personally. I was, I think, one of 80 people. The company was probably about 
two or 300 people. So, you know, it wasn't a small list and I was on it and I took it personally, um, which I think is very typical. And I think it's natural when you go through a setback like that to say, well, oh, this is a reflection on me. I failed. You know, there's some, I did something wrong and, and it can be really hard to recover from that. I think for me, it was actually a huge gift. It helped me exit from a situation in which I was unhappy, but I wasn't brave enough to quit uh, because I thought that too was a signal of failure. It helped me to really think about, it gave me some time and space to think about what I wanted next. And it just kind of kicked me in the butt, you know? So I think the reason I wanted to share this story is because one, I think, again, it's important for people to know that even from, if from a distance, someone looks like they've only had like successes, like there's always more um, than meets the eye. And then, you know, I think the other thing is that it's sometimes those setbacks can end up again, being huge le- leaps forward. Um, if you are able to bring that perspective. Thank you for sharing. Cause uh, to your point, most successful people have had setbacks. You know, like We don't talk about them a lot, but it happens to everybody. If you were starting this journey all over again, what, what advice would you give your younger self? Well, to bring it full circle um, and the conversation we were having earlier about my daughter, I would say be patient. I remember being early in my career and being so anxious to get to the next step, right? When, when am I getting promoted? When am I getting that raise. I want more responsibility. And it's funny because I see that now in my young employees, right? They're so eager to get that external signal of forward momentum. And sometimes you get so caught up in that, that you actually miss the opportunity to learn and grow. And I would say to myself, be patient, just do the work, put your head down, do the work, take on as much as you can for the sake of learning, not for the sake of, you know, patting yourself on the back or getting, you know, an extra gold star, but instead just because the more that you get your hands into, the more you're going to learn, the more you're going to establish relationships and the more you'll grow and be ready for that next thing when it presents itself or when you choose to move on to the next thing. Great advice. Is there a topic that you think marketers should be learning more about or you're trying to learn more about? There are so many. I mean, I think the obvious answer would be like data and analytics. Obviously, our world is moving, you know, faster and faster every day to be data driven and AI driven. And it's critical that marketers understand that. But I think equally important, especially if you want to have a marketing role that drives business impact is to understand the financial world and and really be able to speak the language of the CFO, understand the impact that your activities have on the PL, but also all of your partners' activities. You know, how does your supply chain partner impact the PL and profitability? And how does that interrelate with the company's ability to spend marketing dollars? Because it's also interconnected and it's so easy when you're in a functional area to put your blinders on and just do the thing that you do and not think about how, wow, um, you know, the engineering team or the supply chain or customer service team, we're all affecting each other. And then I think that the next, you know, looking forward and looking up at the consumer, you know, understanding the metaverse, understanding like this whole transformation to the digital world, it's coming. And I think brands that are not looking in that direction and trying to understand where they are able to play a valuable role are going to get left behind. Are there brands, companies, or causes that you follow or you think other people should take notice of? I mean, so many. I'm such a consumer. I'm a very, I just think, actually, just today, I'm like, why is my mailbox only catalogs? And my husband said to me, well, it's because you're shopping all the time. But I do, I, I shop all the time because I really love brands and I love engaging with companies. One of the companies that I love, I tend to really like to patronize sort of startup brands that are, you know, startups and founder led. Uh, There's a brand called Food 52 that I love because I think they're doing some really smart things. They started out as a content site, really recipes um, and cooking content. Then they started um, delivering on the whole content meets commerce, holy grail, and they opened a shop and then they started launching private label, their own branded goods. And now they're consuming heritage cookware brands, which I think is just such an interesting example of the whole ecosystem becoming this one, you know, lump almost like all the disparate parts of the ecosystem in this one space, just kind of melding together. And I think it's representative too of the way the consumer wants to engage with brands, right? If you win my trust through content, then I want to go to you for other things. The way they found their path is by really listening to the customer and building community, 
which is inspiring to me. I think brands that do that, right. Every brand wants to do that, right. And wants to create, cultivate community and, and all that. So the brands that are doing it well, I think are worth noticing. Well, and what a, what a, a testament to content, to your point, like, uh, if you earn trust through content, it's a natural opportunity to open up commerce, <laughs> you know, to transact with you with products and, and other things. So that's amazing. Last question for you on the marketing front. Uh, what's the largest opportunity or biggest threat you think marketers are facing today? I mean, my go-to answer is always going to be um, losing sight of the customer. I think the opportunity is to really pay attention to this Gen Z consumer who is so unique, so vocal, so committed to what they care about and is voting with their dollars to support brands that are paying attention. And I think the threat is to be blind to that vocal customer and ignore what they care about and basically to fall out of, you know, we talk about wanting to be a brand for life or a beloved brand. And I think you just have no chance of that if you're not really thinking about what the what drives the consumer and how you can put yourself into that equation. Dina, thank you so much for coming on the show. I've learned a lot. I've got some uh, brands to go check out. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed this conversation. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with support from my team and podcast editors, sound engineers, and writers at Share Your Genius. Find them at shareyourgenius.com. If you're new to marketing today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners. You can contact me on marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you will also find complete show notes, links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.